Okay, uh, good evening everyone. I hope that all of you can hear me. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to thank Costas and Kevin for organizing this event. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be in South Africa with all of you. Uh, so today we are, we are going to discuss uh, some new perspective on how to describe some of the most important fundamental issues and lessons that we have learned in theoretical physics in the 20th century from the perspective of a notion that I hope to convince you that we all have, which is the notion of, of information, which, is, which explains why this is the title. Uh, don't worry, this happens to me all the time, but apparently uh, this is not jumping. It, it's a quantum effect. <laughs> I have just lost all sorts of information here. Is that Bear with me. Even though we're in the 21st century, we still have technological issues, as you can see. Okay, so uh, I'm sure that all of you have heard the statement that we are completely bombarded and surrounded by information. So just to, to get us started, you know, this can be in the form of uh, newspapers as a standard one, or in terms of the information that encodes who we are in terms of the DNA strand information in biology. If you are more interested, sorry, in uh, in, in astrophysics, just the, the entire catalog of stars, planets, uh, etc. That, that we are learning about. The first point that, that we would like to, to, to make clear here is that the notion of information is not an abstract notion, but it's an actual, it, it's a physical notion. And, and I thought that before doing any theoretical physics, I would try to convince you about this, because this is what you do in, in your everyday life. So, first of all, you all know that information is stored. That's what you use when you hear your CDs or when you transfer information from your memory stick from one person to another. You, you really believe that you are transferring information and that's what you do. So that's physical. It is real. Information is processed and I'm sure that if you have ever lost any information on your laptop, you really felt what it means for, physical, for information to be physical. But another uh, indication that it's real is that if you are trying to run a program with a very slow computer or your internet connection is very slow, I'm pretty sure that you also dis discover that information is uh, quite real. I was going to use a politically incorrect word, but I have stopped myself. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, shit happens. <laughs> now, so yes, information is, is, is physical. Um, how do we typically manipulate it? And I thought I would start like this because, because I think that we, we, we all have much more intuition about this. So let's consider the, the English alphabet. It's a bunch of letters, a bunch of symbols. The way in which we try to quantify information, though we will discuss it a little bit more in detail later, is to assign a code to it. So if you have heard the notion of bits, and the notion that everything is a collection of zeros and ones, this is the idea that if you have a set of symbols, as in this case the set of alphabets, you assign a code which is a string of zeros and ones, and once you do that, notice that you can start asking questions about the efficiency of your coding. And by efficiency, because otherwise you don't really know what that means, efficiency in this, in this particular case, it could mean what is the minimal length of the code that you, can co that you can come up with in such a way that you can invert the code without losing information. So, as soon as you start putting some mathematics, you, you are starting to grasp the idea that this abstract notion of information can be quantified. And this is very important for science. Okay. Now, what is the standard process in some abstract sense? This is how computer science would, 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 would describe this. So you have some sort of data. It may be the DNA information in, in, in each of your cells, a newspaper, whatever. You have some coding procedure by which you map this information to a bunch of zeros and, and ones, and then you do some task with those zeros and ones. That is typically done by a computer, if you, th if you think in terms of zeros and ones. Once the task has been done, like 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's a task, 
that the computers do or calculators do, uh, you get an answer and then this goes through a decoding because the computer will get a bunch of zeros and ones and this is completely unreadable for most humans. And then you decode it and you get some answer which in this case would be four. But one of the points in, in, in my lecture, and I, and I really would like you to start thinking about it, but we will be repeating this, is that uh, you can think about this abstract science that sometimes people refer to as physics as following the same abstract set of, of, of steps. And what I mean is the following. Uh, let's consider this coin. Uh, and I'm just going to hand it in here. The initial state of the coin is at, at a certain height from, from the ground. I'm just going to let it go. And what has happened is that because of gravity, this coin has fallen. So if you, if you understand the task part of it, well, the coding part of it is that I gave you a physical object, and we have just all agreed, or at least you allow me to do so, to say, look, the coin is at, at a one meter position uh, from, from the ground. That's the state of the coin, the location of the coin. Then the task is just the way in which the universe works. In this case, gravity has acted and the, fall, and the, the coin fall. And the outcome of all this is that currently the coin is staying in the ground. So I have just described some process which probably in the university would be an extremely boring one because it would be full of equations in terms of some encoding of information. One of the points of the lecture is that Everything we do in physics can be encoded in this language. Okay. But, uh, so just to make this point further, uh, physics describes nature. I hope that I don't have to describe, uh, to convince you about this. And one of the messages is that everything that happens in, in nature can be described as, as some exchange of information. So, this is why if you think in terms of classical information, everything is a bunch of zeros and ones because you are using some encoding. And you, know, you may well have the picture that some of you already have about the, mat the famous Matrix uh, movies, but I will not debate whether there is an architect or not in this lecture. I'm just saying that everything that we describe in nature as human beings can be describable as exchange of information. But as, as I have said before, uh, if we want to use information for science, uh, we need to be able to quantify it. You know, we, we need numbers. Uh, it's not enough to have a string of zeros and ones, even though you can get quite far. So what I want to do, uh, starting the lecture right now, this was just the introduction, is starting from the flipping of a coin, try to convince you that there is a way of quantifying information, and give you, this is the most important part, some intuition about what information actually means in some scientific, sen uh, scientific sense, not just uh, some sort of newspaper sense, if, if, if you know what I mean. Then probably the most challenging part of, of the lecture uh, will be to convince you that in quantum information we can do the same thing, so I'll try to highlight the main two differences between classical and quantum information. and. Uh, the coolest part of the talk, as far as I'm concerned, is the third dot, though the second dot is extremely fundamental. So we will see that if we are accelerated observers, uh, we would live in a world with finite temperature. And I'll convince you, because I'm sure that I will convince you, that this effect is responsible for why uh, there is a temperature in the cosmic uh, microwave background that we measure in that, that has won already a Nobel Prize, so this is real stuff. And the kind of thing that I'm more interested in, as, as, as Jane was alluding in the introduction, which is black hole physics. And if I have time, but most probably I won't, I will talk about science fiction kind of ideas that we have in our field right now. Okay, so indeed, I need to speed up. Good. Uh, how do we quantify information? Without this, everything is lost. So let's consider a coin. You will all agree that if I flip the coin, I will get either heads and tails. So there is an uncertainty about what is the outcome of this experiment. Unless you measure all the details of what I have just done, a priori there are no possibilities. Let us actually consider that we are dealing with an actual uh, fair coin, 
So this means that you have 50% of uh, probability of getting heads, 50% of probability of getting tails. Um, there is, this is extremely important, there is some uncertainty about the result of the experiment before you do the experiment. That's the first statement that we should all agree. Now, in terms of what I was discussing before, in this case the encoding is very easy. Uh, what I call heads is just a zero, what I call tails is a one, it's, it's a trivial map. There is nothing else to be done. But the crucial, info, the crucial question that was asked by, Shannon, by Claude Shannon was, what is the information that we gain after I have just flipped the coin and I am telling you that it's heads? How much information do I gain? So this was answered in one of the most important papers that has been written in the 20th century in science by Claude Shannon. This is in 1948. Uh, the formula is not to impress you, it's basically to, to just to give evidence that there is some mathematics behind what I'm trying to say. But what we say is that when we actually perform the experiment of flipping a coin, we gain one bit of information. This may not be saying absolutely anything right now to us, but the point that I want to make is the following. I'm going to assign a number, which I'm going to call entropy, this, and I will use the letter capital S. Uh, in the case of a, bear, uh, of a fair coin, uh, the amount of information that I get is one bit, but in order to, to help you to capture the, the meaning of this idea, what I want to is to compare the amount of information that we gain if instead of throwing a fair coin, I throw a bias coin. So let me take an extreme case. Imagine that I give you some tricky coin in which you always get uh, heads. It sounds crazy, and probably you may have not seen such a coin, but it will make the point. If I give you a, a coin that only has heads, you could ask the question, well, why on earth are you going to do the measurement? You will always get heads. There is no uncertainty. The point about Chandler's uh, theory is that if you, if you try to assign some quantity to an event that always occurs, you gain information zero. Yeah, throw this coin a million times, you will get one million heads, you will not learn anything. Whereas when there is uncertainty, this is the crucial statement, there is information to be gained, because you didn't know a priori whether it was heads of, or, or coins. So the slogan is, the first slogan is, entropy, which is a mathematical quantity, actually a physical quantity, I'm sorry, I am a physicist, so let me make this point. Uh, a physical quantity measures uncertainty. If there is no uncertainty, I will always declare that entropy is zero, and by that statement I mean that you learn absolutely nothing. It was always heads. There was nothing to learn. Good. Okay. Now, you may ask, well, how natural it is to have uncertainty in real life? Uh, I hope that many of you uh, agree that this is actually a, a, a rather natural thing, but in case that you are not convinced by this, and before discussing a real example, like the guys in this room, I thought that we would play a small game. It's a stupid game, but it will make a point. The game is described in this slide. It consists of the following elements. There are four small cells. By cell, I mean this square. There is one square here, which is white, one black, black. So there are four, four small cells. And each cell can be either white or black. Using our trivial coding map, I will either be talking about black and white or zero and ones. In this case, I think I will just be referring to whites and, and, white, and blacks. Good. Now, the first uh, cell can have two possible colors. The same is true of the other one. So the combination of the, these two cells has four configurations. So the total number of configurations of four cells is 2 to the 4, which is just 16. There are 16 different uh, distributions of white and black small cells. Okay? 16. And we can agree, this is our calling in this particular example, that each of these 16 configurations is given by a code of four numbers, where the first one encodes the first cell, second, third one. Okay. 
The rule of the game, which may make it silly, but bear with me for a couple of minutes, please, is that, uh, you know, I'm not a very good experimentalist, and the, I have a constraint. I know that there are four cells, which is a lot of information, it could be 8, 12, I know that there are four cells, but I can only measure the total number of black cells, not where they are. Okay? This is a, the crucial point. Okay? This, this, is a, this is a game. Good. Now, what can we do with this? So, my plan is to go case by case. Let's start with the cases where there are no surprises. Uh, I measure the number of blocks, which I, ha I have called E, and I will interchangeably talk about E or gray, which is just E divided by 4, fine. The two easy examples are the cases in which G is zero. If G is zero, it means that the number of blocks is zero. And we all agree that if there are no black cells, it, it's because all the small cells are white. Okay? The important conclusion is that in this case, there is no uncertainty. There is only one configuration. Uh, there is nothing to win once you know that G is zero. So you need to do the experiment. You measure. By the same token, if G is equal to 1, it means that the four cells are black. And there is nothing else to be said. There is only one such configuration. So again, there is no uncertainty once you have done the experiment. But things get more interesting when the number of black cells is either 1, 2, or 3, not 0 and 4. This is what I call a gray cell, which is this picture here. Uh, so, if I measure that there are two black cells, as in, as in this picture here, the rules of the game are such that you don't know whether they are these of diagonal ones, or these two ones, or any other distribution. So, since you don't have full... let me put it this way, since you are not God, and you don't know which of the four cells are black, there is an uncertainty. And according to our previous discussion, there should be some information to be gained about this. That's precisely uh, what Shannon could do. So let me go through the details. Given any number of black cells, like two in the previous example, in this example there are two, there are six ways in which I can choose two black cells out of four cells. Uh, this is this number here, I just wrote the formula in general, but in the case that in which E is equal to 2, there are 6 numbers, so DE would be equal to 6. And if you declare that all the different configurations of the distribution of cells have the same probability, like in a fair coin, I can use the same formula that Shannon told us to use for the fair coin, and I get that the entropy that I gain if I would be God and I would know which of the configurations I am actually in, is log 6. The important, the important point about this game is not the fact that I can associate a number, it's the fact that when you don't have full knowledge over the system that you are looking at, you create uncertainty. And you know this. Uh, we are not Superman, we, are, we don't have X-ray, I, I don't know what is inside any of the ladies' bags in here. So there is some uncertainty for me. It's, it's just a fact. It's a fact of life. I, I can make some guesses, but I'm sure I will not get them right. Or not all right. So what is the lesson of this game? The lesson is, this is a technical word, the lesson is that if I don't have access to the entire, to the small cells, I am losing information, and that losing of information generates uncertainty, and in our previous discussions this means that there is information. The slogan is that entropy, uncertainty, is actually relative to your state of knowledge. If you have access to the small cells, there is no uncertainty. If you only have access to the big picture, life becomes full of uncertainties. Now, this may look like a very abstract uh, example, uh, but actually, in my opinion, uh, this is the heart and soul of a very technical but uh, infinitely useful subject, 
in theoretical physics, which is thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. So basically, physicists believe that everything that we have learned in this game controls every... I'm going to destroy this stage. I knew that this was going to happen. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, that everything, every, every single physical system that we are aware of satisfies the same rules that we have just learned. So you can avoid going to the university. You will not learn more than this. Uh, I can guarantee you that. Uh, you learn many formulas, but the concepts are different from formulas. So the idea, just to summarize, is that when I measure something as a human being, that's the analog of the number of black cells, I am only measuring a very small amount of the information that determines my system. You know, I'm made of molecules, but we don't see them. You need some specific measurements to, 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 to look at that. So, the reason why there is entropy is, is because there are many small configurations of the details that you don't see that are compatible with your measurement. This happens to every, to all of us, every single day of our life. That's human experience. We don't live with quantum mechanics. That, we don't have access to that. Very importantly, we could also ask what happens in our game if instead of measuring E, I measure E plus 1 in that particular case. So instead of 2, 3. You can ask what is the gain, the variation in the information when your measurement changes by one unit. And I claim that this relation is always linear. One of the points of the rest of the talk is to convince you that the coefficient of proportionality is something that you are very, very well aware of. This is what physicists call temperature. So temperature is the relation between the variation in the amount of information that you gain when you do some experiment when your experiment changes a little bit. Uh, to see this, let's discuss the weather forecast, which by the way I'm told that today it was supposed to be dry but because it's winter, but it was not dry. Uh, now, this is just an example of what I meant by the universality of thermodynamics. Everything that we learn in our game happens when you watch the BBC weather forecast or the South African uh, national TV forecast. What happens there? Well, let's take the perspective of the big cell the, in, in terms of our, of our language. Let's take the perspective of a human being. What do you hear in a weather forecast? The only thing that you hear, you see these maps, they, they hardly ever explain to you what they are, but you hear, you, you, you see some numbers, some quantities, but very few of them, which is quite shocking, as I'll try to make the point. You only hear about something called pressure, you may hear about something called temperature, and if we're inside a, a, a box like this room, so a finite uh, place, you, you talk about the volume, no? uh, how big this room is. Three numbers, maybe they mention something, I actually doubt it, three numbers. And with three, these three numbers, they make predictions. I mean, surely they must be kidding. This, this, this doesn't make sense. Uh, but, but they do. And as you know, sometimes they get it right. Uh, now, the important point is that the claim that has been made to all of us, and this is our experience, is that we have very few numbers. You are describing a very complex system. By complex, I mean that if you listen to a physicist or to a chemist, they are going to tell you, look, man, I don't know what the BBC people are talking about. But I can assure you that the stuff that is in this room is made out of a huge number of molecules that are moving around in all sorts of directions. You should think of this picture as the small cell picture in our game. We don't measure the motion of the individual particles, because for that you would have to be you know, some sort of uh, practical god, uh, in some sense. Uh, you only measure the quantities that I was alluding to before by the BBC guy. So you only measure the pressure or the temperature. The claim is that when you go from one description to the other, you are losing information, just as we lost it. You know, when I go from this picture, to this picture, I don't know 
what is happening with molecule 3007. I have absolutely no idea what happened to it. But more importantly, I also have no idea what happened to the molecule 2008. It doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know where they are. So we don't keep track of that stuff. That generates uncertainty, and that generates information. It's the same lesson. Every single physical system is the same from the perspective of a human being. OK? So what is important is that when you deal with a gas and you talk about the energy of the gas, the volume of this room, the temperature of the gas, this magnitude satisfies this equation. But guess what? This equation is the same one that we saw in our game. The only difference is that right now there are more variables. But if I remove this piece here, this is the same thing that I said before. So in, in that particular case, I hope that no one would deny that this information is physical. It's, it's the information about what is happening with the individual molecules. These molecules do exist. Uh, and more importantly, perhaps for my purposes, this temperature is physical, because in this room, you can measure a temperature. But that temperature is a measure of how the information changes when the energy of the gas changes. So the temperature is a much more general notion than just what you measure with a thermometer. It's just that you may need some specific thermometers to measure the temperature of other systems. Okay? Good. So in particular, for those that are interested in the case of a gas, T measures how quickly the, the, the molecules are moving on average. That's the technical statement. But now, all this is classical, and the good thing is that all of you have some intuition. Uh, oh, God. I'm doing very badly with time, Kevin, and, and uh, okay. You're gonna kill me. Uh, okay. I need to switch gears, because otherwise this, this talk will not be so cool. Um, and I need to talk about uh, quantum mechanics. So, my strategy is the following. We've talked about uh, coins, and we've seen that you have heads on or tails. There is either zero or one, and what you learn when you throw a coin is one bit of information. In terms of a graph, if you prefer it, you only have two possibilities, either a zero or either a one. Now, you can ask the question, okay, there is something that some cool people call quantum mechanics. Uh, what is the easiest system that resembles a classical coin, in the sense that when you measure some observable, you only get two outcomes, which is the analog of zero or one. What happens when you go to quantum mechanics, which is the first surprise, is that uh, the, the states, the, the states that such quantum coin has, are a linear combination of zeros and ones. This is just notation; it's superposition. And I'm telling you that when you flip the coin in the same way that you were doing, or that I did a few minutes ago, the outcome of that experiment is the following. You get heads, which is zero, with probability alpha squared. Let's forget about the bars, this is just technicalities. And you get tails, which in our coding means one, with probability beta squared. So for the time being, everyone here would say, okay, Juan, I don't know what, what this has to do with quantum mechanics, because you are basically giving me the same answer as in an unfair coin. If alpha squared and beta squared would be different from one half, you would say that this is an unfair coin. The, the tricky part, in fact, the, tri the, the tricky part to explain, is that there is more than one dosing that you can do. This is the crucial part. When I flip this coin, there is only one flipping operation that you can do. Okay? Uh, there is only flip, flip one. There is no notion of flip two, flip three. It just happens that in quantum mechanics, there is more than one flipping operation. In some sense, this is how, what, how many people try to explain this, there are different abstract directions and it's like saying that flipping the coin in the x direction or in the z direction are different operations. So I'm going to take this as granted, and the claim is that I can find a new flipping operation which has no classical analog. This is the important thing. This is why the quantum wall is very strange to us. 
in which my, the state of my quantum coin is not heads or tails. It's a linear combination of it. In other words, there are many more quantum states than the ones that we see in classical physics. What I mean by that, because I will insist on this in the coming minutes, is that in terms of a classical coins, there were only zeros and ones, period. But I'm claiming that in quantum mechanics, you have an entire set of points in a three-dimensional sphere which are different states. And I can identify them with certainty. This doesn't happen, obviously, with a classical coin, where I only have zeros and ones. So, I don't expect you to understand this, but th there are... Well, uh, and if you do, great. Uh, because when I was preparing the talk, I was quite convinced that at this point people will throw me tomatoes. Uh, but uh, but y you have to follow the logic. The, 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 uh, I am insisting too to, to much in the details. The, the, the first lesson, independently of the details, is that if I try to describe something that resembles a classical coin in quantum mechanics, there are many more configurations than just up and down, period. This is an axiom. It just happens to be that way. And I want to discuss an application of this fact. Because if, if instead of having one coin, I have two coins, in our classical intuition, the number of configurations are either heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, tails. But in quantum mechanics, I have the freedom to turn on all these different quantities, which are alpha, beta, and lambda. So there are many more states. But the cool thing that people working with quantum co computers claim that they will achieve, and they are achieving, you know, if I compare the state of the art when I was a PhD student with now, it cannot even be compared. It's fascinating what they have achieved. Is that this guy here, no matter how complicated it may look to you, is just one state. But that state knows about four, the four different classical states that you may be thinking in mind. Okay? This is very important. It's very important for the following reason. Because if instead of having two coins, you have n coins, the number of states is 2 to the n, which is a very huge number. As n grows, this becomes infinite for all our purposes. But let, let me put some numbers in perspective. If I give you 300 quantum coins, 300 quantum coins, 300 is a reasonable number, I hope, uh, the number of states that I would write down which would not fit into a single slide equals the total number of atoms that we are aware of in the universe. But the claim is that with a single quantum mechanical state, I can describe all the atoms in the universe. And that's cool. That's cool. That's cool because of this. That's cool because if you compare the power of a classical computer, which is the one that you use, we all use, I'm sorry, with the future quantum computers, if we manage to resolve some, some technicalities, it summarizes in this statement here. If you ask a classical computer to factorize a number with 150 digits, which is a huge task for a human being, uh, classical computers may be able to do it in one year. Let's say that this is true. If you follow this law, if you would like to factorize a 400 digit, which is a crazy number, it would actually take longer than the life of the universe. So a classical computer can actually don't do it. Certainly not in the lifetime of, of a human being, so that's not very useful. But by the same token, uh, the same 150 digit takes one month for a quantum computer, at least with current technology. And this means that if you would attempt the factorization of a 400 digit, it would take one year in human life units. So you would see it happening. So quantum computers are much faster. It, it's cool. Uh, it's cool. Okay. So uh, now, should I do the experiment? Yes. Okay. I need to volunteer. I am very delayed in time, but I don't mind. I need to volunteer. I'm not kidding. Please, please. Uh, uh, 
Let's, let's have one lady and one gentleman. So, so uh, okay, good. Okay, so before presenting the, uh, just come up, I think that this is a good place I was told. I just follow orders. Okay, so here I have two, uh, two objects, two disks. The important thing is that one of them is reddish or yellow, depending on which side I show you, so it's, it's a color one, and the other one is black. Okay? Good. Now, the experiment consists in the following. I'm going to ask you, if, if you trust me, to, to, to close your eyes and give me your hand. You close. Hand. You close. Now, you, you can go down there for a few seconds, please. Uh, now you can open your eyes. Open your hand. What is the color of the magnet that I gave you? Red. Do you know the color of the magnet that she has? Black. Good. Do you all agree with this? Yes. Now she can show. Is it black? Well, it's part of black. Good. Okay. So good, good, good. Thank you very much. So, this is a stupid experiment, you can sit down, thank you very much. Uh, I always wanted to be a magician, but uh, you know, I, I have to take advantage of this possibility. Okay, okay, let, 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 let's, let's uh, it's good to cool down a little bit uh, after uh, the exposition to quantum mechanics. But, but, but I actually want to introduce a very important element in, in this discussion. Uh, what has just happened in front of our eyes, as stupid as it may sound, is something that helps to illustrate the notion of what uh, the technical jargon means correlation. So, uh, there were some uncertainty. The only uncertainty that you had is whether I had given the gentleman the red one or the black one. But as soon as the gentleman made a measurement and declared to all of us, look, I've got the red one, then the lady unless some kind of very weird thing happens in the universe, has to have the purple or the black one. There was a correlation, because you knew that there were only two options, red and black. I want to explore this notion in quantum mechanics, and we will discover something that, unless I am mistaken, you have never seen. And this is the heart of the talk. It's called entanglement. And in fact, it goes under the following slogan. When I was discussing more than one quantum coin, I was writing down these states. Of course, for us, this doesn't mean much. But what I want to stress is that in the classical world, if you have two coins, the description of your classical coins involves two numbers. Either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, or 1, 0. In other words, if you know, as in our experiment, if you know that both uh, coins are heads, the system of the two coins necessarily has to be two heads. Do we all agree with this? In other words, in a classical world, if you know what happens with the small pieces of your system, you know what happens with the entire piece of your system. That sounds boring. In fact, I'm going to claim that in quantum mechanics, this is not the case. And the responsible is entanglement. So imagine that I give you a state, which is just this 0, 0, plus 1, 1. This is just notation. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what happens if you flip this quantum coin in the following way. So I need to describe some rules. Imagine that I take the first coin, quantum coin, and I bring it to the orbit where we are. And we do the flipping the quantum flipping. What you will get in this state is that you will get heads or tails with a 50% of probability. I claim this, I don't explain this, I just claim this. Let's take the second point and to emphasize how dramatic the effect is, let's take it to the moon and do the experiment there. For this state that I have chosen here, you also get heads and tails 50%. So, so far, everything sounds purely classical, and you should be disappointed with what I'm saying. And that's cool, because that's the idea. Uh, now, what is important is that if you ring 
the experimenter in the moon and you let him know, him or her know, what is the outcome of your experiment, what you will realize is that when God prepared this state, you will realize that every time that you see heads, the guy in the moon will also see heads. And every time the guy that every time that we see tails here, the guy in the moon will have also seen tails. There is a correlation just as in the experiment that we have done in real time. Okay? This is happening because I chose this state. I could have chosen a different state. So I will stick with this state. Okay, what does this mean? In pictures, in, ca in case that it helps, we are here in the orbit, we have some box, and no matter which side of the box we open, whenever I get a red, the guy in the moon will also see a red. If I open a different side of the box and I get a maroon or whatever it is called, the same thing happens in the other side. There is a correlation. Good. Uh, I can simulate this classically, but I'm going to ignore it because I have described it already. You need to form in order to discover what is going on in here. I will come back to this in a second. But what is important to make my point is that I have said that in quantum mechanics there are more flipping operations than the ones that you think in the classical world. So, if we were to bring the coin from the moon to the earth, uh, to the orbit, and we would have the two quantum coins here, we could just look at both of them at the same time. And I would discover that my state is this one with certainty. That's the crucial part. Now, if I would be lecturing, now I would ask a question to the audience. I have just told you that I can make a measurement and I can identify that the state of the two coins that I gave you, quantum coins, is identified with certainty. By our previous discussion, this means that when you, there is no information in this state. So the entropy that Shannon would associate with it is zero. I can find a measurement that identifies this state with certainty. If there is certainty, there is nothing to be gained. The crucial part in quantum mechanics, no matter what other people tell you, is that if you don't have access to the two quantum coins, but only one coin, let's call this subsystem one, coin one, we have just said that if you do the experiment in the orbit without knowing what is happening in the moon, there is an uncertainty. You are obtaining heads or tails 50%. There is uncertainty. This, is, this means that from your perspective, the perspective of someone doing the experiment that we just made, there is some information to gain. In other words, in quantum mechanics, you can know the entire system the, the entire state of the system with certainty, but this does not mean that you know the subsystems. Yeah. Okay? So this is something that you have not experienced in your life because that doesn't happen with classical coins. This is entanglement. And, okay, I wanted to... Okay, this is entanglement. This is the main distinguish distinguishing fact between quantum physics and classical physics, in my opinion. Now, to relate this fact, I'm very delayed, so I will not talk about black holes, apologies, but I will be around to talk about it if you want to. What I wanted to do is to put together what we have just learned, which, believe me, is a lot. Conceptual is a lot, so uh, it's, a, it's a hard thing to understand. Uh, with the most important things that have been done in physics in the 20th century. And to do that, I need to explain relativity. But you have all heard this. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. That's what relativity will mean for me. So that's that picture. Now, in, uh, yes, I wanted to emphasize how confusing that statement should actually be if you think about it. Because you are not used to the fact that the speed of light is the same no matter your state of motion. But let's discuss this over a cocktail. Uh, uh, the, 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 the idea here is that in relativistic theories, all the information about your full system is encoded in t equal constant slices. So I give you a picture of my system. This is this real line. I am in two dimensions. 
and now I discretize my real life into uh, small pieces. And now what you should be thinking, for the sake of this lecture, so I'm lying a little bit to you, but I, I hope that this is useful, is that in each of these small pieces that make up the real line, you have a quantum coin. That's a relativistic system. You have an infinite number of quantum coins, in fact. So that makes life interesting, but also more difficult. You have to do a lot of stuff with an infinite number of coins. Now, the notion of subsystem could be, just as in our case, we had two, two coins, and one subsystem was just one coin, and the other one, now there are many more choices. The question that I want to ask is, if we can associate subsystems with our state of motion, which is something that all of you should feel very uh, natural. You know, when you drive with a car, you are moving with a certain velocity, and if you are not moving in the car, you are not moving at that velocity. The, the crucial idea is that let's consider what happens to an accelerated observer. Uh, intuitively, when you are in a car and you accelerate, you start moving faster and faster. If you could believe in Newton, you, your velocity will grow up without bound, because for Newton, the velocity of light is infinite. But for Einstein, the velocity of light is finite. So this means that if I plot since we know that uh, uh, line, uh, let me rewind. Since we know that light moves in a straight lines, which are these straight lines here, the diagonal ones, if you start your car here at some constant acceleration, at long times your trajectory, which is the red trajectory, will approach the light trajectory. You can never go across the velocity of light, right? So that's what you would move. The question that I want to ask is, if you are a guy living in this uh, super cool accelerating car, what, what is the piece of the universe that you can see? And the piece of the universe, I really mean this picture. So let, let's do the experiment. Uh, I am someone not moving in this cool car, which is this blue line, and I keep sending light to the guy in the, in the red car. You can see that if I am in this point here, the light which follows this 45 degree line will never intersect the, right, the, 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 the red line. So this means that you cannot see everything that is happening in your universe because you are accelerating. That's cool. That's cool because it means that if you live in an accelerating car, the only information that you can see is the information about half of the line not the entire line. And if you have followed the logic of the previous part of the talk, this means that you have lost the information about anything that was happening on the left. This means that you have coarse grain, you have lost information, there is entropy. The conclusion of this is that if you were to live in a constant accelerated car, you would be living at finite temperature, my friends. This is not the temperature of the atmosphere, this is the intrinsic temperature that you would feel. And this is a quantum effect, it's a very famous effect. It depends on H bar, it means that it's quantum mechanical, it depends on the acceleration, and it depends on C. So if the velocity of light would be infinite, this effect is gone. Why is this cool? I don't have time, because otherwise this gentleman is going to kill me. But this is cool because it explains why the universe uh, when we look back into the past, we only see a small part of the universe. We don't see all the universe, we lose information. This is the temperature that you measure. Uh, this is a Nobel Prize winning thing. This is a measure of... Sorry? Yes. <laughs> imagine how meaningful it is, the bird shape. Uh, imagine how meaningful it is. And it also explains a lot of physics, but uh, unfortunately uh, I will explain this some other time or during the break. Uh, thank you very much.